Dear students, in these two uh, lectures I would like to give an overview of the functional relations of the upper limb. The purpose of the lecture is not to give a detailed anatomical description of all the bones and joints and muscles and nerves and arteries, but to draw your attention to some functional details. Of course, the detailed anatomy is given in the practicals and you can learn muscles and joints uh, from uh, your anatomy book. So I would like to just give you some uh, details that um, many times we notice students don't know or don't understand very easily or that are important from the functional point of view, clinical point of view. These uh, slides marked with the uh, smiley, with a smiley, are important also for the exam. So in the first part I would like to talk about bones, joints and muscles. Uh, about some bones, of course, the most important clinical relation is different fractures and one of the most commonly fractured bone is the clavicle uh, with the weakest part here, where shown with the arrow. And when the uh, clavicle is broken in this typical part, then the coracoacromial ligaments prevent the dislocation of the joint, the sternocleidomastoid muscle pulls uh, the proximal part of the clavicle upwards and the arm is adducted by the pectoralis major. This can happen also during uh, childbirth when the clavicle is uh, pushed too strongly and it can be broken. This is already an important slide for the, the exam as well, the shoulder joint. You learned the details already in the first few weeks and you learned that it has a very loose white capsule. There is incongruence between the articulating surfaces. The glenoid um, cavity is a very shallow surface. So this is why uh, the shoulder joint is a very free joint with most uh, possible movements. So it has very free movements, but this is the price we pay for uh, the uh, for the free movements, that it is the most frequently dislocated joint. So normally the coracoacromial ligament prevents upward dislocation. It is like a fornix over the uh, humerus and um, this is a very very strong ligament preventing upward dislocation and the rotator cuff, very very important uh, group of muscles, uh, shown here, just like fingers above the shoulder joint. These prevent downward dislocation. Here you can see uh, which muscles form the rotator cuff, supraspinate, infraspinate and teres minor here, and then anteriorly the subscapular muscle, and these prevent downward dislocation. If these muscles are paralyzed, uh, for example, in brachial plexus palsy paralysis, here you can see that the shoulder actually drops, the humerus drops, this is a kind of subluxation. Here you can see uh, other types of uh, complete dislocations and uh, mostly, most commonly, the dislocation is downward and forward. For example, if you fall on your arm or in this case, if the brachial plexus is lesioned. In these cases, uh, because the axillary nerve runs nearby, the axillary nerve can be also lesioned, it can be damaged. The reposition is uh, the patient is in the prone position and weight is applied on the dislocated shoulder. These pictures show possible uh, ways to uh, do the reposition of the shoulder joint. Uh, other joints can be also dislocated, for example the acromioclavicular joint by falling on the arm as well. Here you can see like a stair, uh, like stairs, the uh, dislocation. This won't be asked, I just wanted to show you that of course any joint can be dislocated. Next, if we go uh, distally along the uh, upper limb, here we reach the olecranon, it's an important point. It's also called the student's elbow when the <coughs> bursa here is uh, <coughs> inflamed. This is because 
there is repeated excessive pressure and friction or when you fall on the elbow this can be uh, inflamed. Then of course the elbow joint can be also dislocated obviously most commonly by different trauma and uh, falling on the arm for example with weight and with speed and it can be combined with fractures and ligament and nerve lesions. This is a subluxation of the radial head, the head of the radius, which we know is surrounded by the annular ligament of the radius, uh, which surrounds the circumference of the radius. And in children, it still doesn't hold the radius so tightly. So it means that by playing this game, uh, the head of the radius can be dislocated, so it's actually a dangerous uh, thing to do. Then uh, let's just summarize what nerves can be lesioned by fra different fractures. For example, the humerus, as you can see, all big nerves, almost all of the big nerves, go around the humerus close to the bone at one point of their course. For example, the uh, axillary nerve loops around the uh, uh, the neck of the humerus, the radial nerve, we learned it already the first week of anatomy that it goes in the radial uh, nerve, the groove for the radial nerve in the posterior part of the humerus. So a fracture here can easily damage the radial nerve. Or around the elbow, we find the radial nerve also coming back uh, to the front or the median and ulnar. So all the three big nerves are around the uh, the elbow joint, so fractures in this area can also damage any of these nerves. And then uh, we go on listily and we find the radius. The radius is a very commonly broken bone. When you fall like this and you, uh, you fall on your hand uh, and forearm, then the radius is uh, fractured in a typical point. It's called cause fracture. This is the distal part of the radius. And then uh, the hand has a very peculiar position. It's, uh, there is a displacement of the hand uh, looking like a fork. It's called also the fork deformity, which then uh, the doctor can recognize without looking at the x-ray that most probably this is the problem. And going more distally, when you fall in your hand or uh, hand is kicked or playing the ball uh, with speed and very strong uh, movement, uh, the, the scaphoid bone can be also broken and uh, this uh, is a dangerous thing because the, uh, the scaphoid bone has very poor blood supply so uh, there is either operation or the cast had to be worn for 12 weeks because you have to uh, give time for healing. The healing is very slow uh, because of the poor blood supply. And finally, a broken hand. Of course, the metacarpus or the finger, the phalanges can be also broken by different uh, injuries. And of course, any injury on the hand, especially the fingertips, uh, is very, very painful given that uh, the fingers are very, very finely innovated with lots of nerve endings. So, of course, it's very painful. And finally, before we go to the muscles, uh, I just have to mention briefly the palmar aponeurosis, which we all know is under the skin. Next layer is the aponeurosis, and then the other structures, tendons, nerves, and arteries uh, come. And here you can see that these are actually the palmar aponeurosis fibers are running mainly longitudinally, so these can when they shorten uh, uh, mainly because of repeated trauma, repeated mechanical stress. If somebody works, for example, uh, with the hand, then these can be contracted. It's called the Puritan uh, contracture, and then some, uh, the, the patient cannot extend the fingers, and this is actually a very uh, big operation because the whole hand has to be cut up uh, to uh, short to uh, uh, cut these shortened fibers. Then we turn to the muscles. Of course, my aim is not to 
uh, list you all the muscles of the upper limb and uh, tell you which muscle uh, originates and inserts where and what is the function and what is the innovation. This you learn from tables and in the classes. I just wanted to draw the attention to some of the details and I want you to think in, uh, in muscle groups. Many times the innovation is similar of a muscle group and uh, some similar functions. So it's very important to also think in muscle groups. Uh, so these are the six muscle groups of the upper limb. Uh, the uh, spinal humeral, the thoracohumeral, the shoulder muscles, arm, forearm and hand muscles. And again, uh, what is important for the exam, I will specifically emphasize. So let's start with the upper back or spinal humeral muscles and just the two biggest ones, the trapezius and latissimus muscles. And here I would like to draw your attention to one common mistake. When we ask about a muscle, most of the times we ask you to identify a muscle or show a muscle, and then we ask about origin, insertion, function and innervation. And a common mistake uh, by the students is that they say two antagonistic movements as a function. For example, flexion extension, abduction adduction. One muscle cannot do both. It's either flexion or extension, either abduction or adduction. But if we have a huge muscle with different parts, fibers running in different directions, then it is possible that two different parts to do two different things. For example, trapezius is an excellent example for this. Uh, it's a very big muscle starting from the occipital bone to the 12th thoracic vertebra. So it has descending, straight and ascending fibers. So obviously the descending and ascending fibers can do opposite things. The descending fibers lift the shoulder girdle, the uh, descending fibers uh, depress the shoulder. All the fibers together bring uh, the scapula backwards, so pull the shoulder girdle backwards. So when you stand nicely straight, uh, this is due to the trapezius muscle, partially at least. So this is a, an example for this. Different fibers do different things. Latissimus is a huge muscle, so all these uh, training positions that I show here are important for the latissimus training and uh, this latissimus means widest muscle so this is the widest uh, back muscle and this little picture uh, helps you to remember like the back pocket muscle because this is exactly what it does it does adduction what do you need to reach for the for a back pocket uh, you need to adduct uh, you need to do internal rotation and retroflexion. This is exactly what the uh, latissimus does. Next group is the thoracohumeral muscles between thorax and humerus, so as the name tells you. And the biggest member is the pectoralis major. Again, we have a muscle with descending, straight and ascending fibers. So these things can do different things, although the whole muscle as one does mainly adduction and anteflexion. And because it goes to the anterior part of the humerus, it does medial rotation. You can try, especially, you can try to touch um, your own muscles and try to feel the movements. This is especially important during these times when there, you have no access to, to, to the cadaver. Uh, it's very important that you also learn to orientate yourself on your own body. So, and you can feel, you can feel these things. You can feel if you lift your arm, what happens in the pectoralis major muscle. So, all these exercises shown here are for the uh, pectoralis major muscle. And of course, this has clinical importance as well. Uh, for example, in breast cancer, if it affects the uh, the muscle itself, the lymphatic vessels going through the muscle or between pectoralis major and minor, sometimes the muscle has to be removed 
as well uh, in a breast cancer operation. Or in plastic surgery, it's important because the um, implant can be implanted in front or between the two muscles. And this can also affect, of course, men, uh, not only women. Uh, some uh, men want big pectoralis muscles without um, uh, suffering in the gym, uh, then they can have pectoralis implant. The region, not the pectoralis muscle, but the region, the infraclavicular region, is important also for implanting the pacemaker. In this uh, area here you can see a pacemaker implanted. Next member of this group, the thoracohumeral group, is another huge muscle, the serratus muscle, anterior serrate muscle, which basically covers the whole lateral part of the thorax, coming from nine ribs and going to the medial part of the scapula. This uh, is very important for lifting the arm above 90 degrees. This can be asked also at the shoulder joint question and of course at the body walk, uh, anterior serratus muscle, and you can feel it. You can touch your own inferior angle of the uh, scapula and you can feel that till 90 degrees nothing really happens with the inferior angle, it doesn't move because up to 90 degrees it's the deltoid muscle. Above 90 degrees you can feel the inferior angle of the scapula moving laterally, rotating. It's because the anterior serrate pulls the whole scapula and with the scapula goes the humerus above 90 degrees. So this is the uh, muscle to lift the arm above 90 degrees. And um, also it's very important for fixing the scapula, fixing, and this is what is missing when the uh, nerve innervating the long thoracic nerve innervating the muscle is lesioned. It's also called backpack injury because sometimes badly designed very heavy backpack exactly uh, compresses the nerve on the lateral side of the thorax and then this is a very easy test uh, to see if the two scapulas are asymmetrical then there can be the possibility of the long thoracic nerve anterior serratus muscle lesion. And of course the patient is not able to lift uh, the arm above 90 degrees. These muscles, the thoracohumeral muscles, especially pectoralis major and anterior serratus, but of course the smaller ones too, are also serving as uh, muscles assisting breathing. This usually uh, is known by the students, so students say as a function, uh, that they assist breathing, but when we ask how is this possible, what is the explanation of this mechanism, then many times we don't get a good answer. So the, the main thing is to see that they primarily, these muscles primarily move the upper limb, because we consider the thorax, the, uh, the, the trunk fixed, and then we describe muscle movements uh, in the extremities. But it's possible to fix the other end, so to fix the arm, and then these muscles will lift the ribs. So these muscles help breathing by a fixed upper limb. This is very important, and this is what people know up subconsciously. You don't know about it because you know anatomy, you do it after jogging or when you cannot breathe uh, properly, you do it because you do it automatically, the body finds its way to breathe more easily uh, by using these muscles. So when you, uh, after running, when you stop, you put your hands uh, like this on your, on your knee, you fix your arm and it's easier to breathe. Or patients with uh, breathing problems. They sit up, fix their arm uh, by sitting up or half uh, sitting up, uh, fixing the elbow. They fix the upper limb to use these muscles that help breathing. Next group is the shoulder muscles. Of course the biggest one is the deltoid. Again we have a muscle with different parts. Uh, anterior, middle and posterior part doing different things. Uh, rotation, 
as you can see. Uh, all these uh, back ones that go to the humerus from the back, they do lateral or outer rotation because they rotate outer, outwards. These are actually logical to see. So the function shouldn't be memorized just from the tables given in the atlas or your book, but you should see how the muscle is running and try to imagine what happens if the fibers contract, then you have lateral rotation. Those that go from forward to the humerus, they do medial rotation. So the teres major and the subscapularis muscle. Deltoid does both because we have a muscle with anterior and posterior parts. The anterior part does medial rotation, posterior part does lateral rotation. Again, this is something you can feel on your own shoulder. You put your hand here and you can feel how your muscle moves and you will remember much better. Uh, so the deltoid muscle does, of course, as the whole muscle, does abduction to 90 degrees only. And the posterior part, as I already said, does lateral rotation, but also does uh, retroflexion. This again you can feel. And the anterior part does medial rotation and antiflexion. The area itself is important also for vaccinations. And these pictures show how you can train the deltoid muscles, of course doing abduction mainly. Uh, next group is the arm flexors, all of them innovated by the musculocutaneous nerve, the biceps, the coracobrachialis and the brachialis muscles. Usually students know this very well. Uh, when we ask about the, um, uh, the function, then uh, of course everybody knows that the biceps does flexion in the elbow joint, but the other functions many times are ignored, but these are also very important, for example, supination. So it, it goes to the radius, it attaches to the radial tuberosity, so it rotates the radius, it does supination, very strong supinator by flexed elbow, and because both heads also uh, bridge over the shoulder joint, they both do antiflexion as well. The arm extensors, this is basically the triceps with the three heads and uh, the triceps does extension of the elbow joint except for the long head which in addition, so it does of course extension in the elbow joint but in addition because it again uh, goes through, not through but bridges the shoulder joint, uh, it does retroflexion as well. And then uh, finally we reached the uh, forearm muscles. Basically we can say that the uh, extensors start from, from and around the lateral epicondyle and the, uh, the flexors from and around the medial epicondyle, innervated by the radial nerve, the extensors, and medial and ulnar nerve by uh, the, the flexors. The ulnar ones are innervated by the ulnar nerve. We are going to talk uh, separately about the hand muscles. So if you know that the extensors uh, originate from around the, uh, the lateral epicondyle, then an overuse, uh, chronic mechanical stress of the extensor muscles will be able to cause an inflammation here. This is called lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow because it's a typical injury uh, in tennis players but of course any other work can cause the same thing. Or uh, the opposite is the overuse of the flexors. This is called golf elbow. It's a medial epicondylitis so when the flexors are overused. When we talk about the muscles of the forearm, we have to mention the individual variations, which is very, very common. It can be, of course, with any other muscle, but uh, the, the flexors of the forearm uh, can show individual variations very often. 
The uh, best example is the Palmaris longus, which uh, is missing actually in about 20% of the people. And you can check it very easily on your own hand, whether you have the Palmaris longus or not. Uh, you do like this with your fingers, and as shown in the picture, and you do flexion. And then you can see here this uh, tendon in the middle. This is the Palmaris longus. If it's flat for you, then you don't have the Palmaris longus, but uh, don't feel disabled because it's a very common variation and the upper neurosis in this case will start from the flexor retinaculum, so there is absolutely no uh, problem. And uh, finally, a few words about tendon sheets and uh, tendons. Of course, they can be injured to the long uh, tendons of the fingers and about tendon sheets it's very important to mention that for the smooth movements of the flexors, flexor tendons, uh, we need this uh, tendon sheet. So this is the bone and then you can see that there is a double layer of the synovial membrane with an outer and an inner layer. The inner layer directly covering the tendon and the outer layer uh, is a little bit more Part. Between the two layers we have a synovial cavity filled with some synovial fluid which uh, uh, makes it possible uh, that the tendon is smoothly moving. And here uh, just one uh, picture about the vincular arteries that they are very very fine arteries running to the uh, tendons of the uh, uh, superficial and the deep uh, flexors and these are in the uh, uh, mesotendons and it's very important that these are not lifted during surgery because then this part of the tendon will uh, die. Here uh, with the tendons or both palmary and dorsally we always ask the tendon sheets uh, please learn it very well from uh, your book uh, the tendon sheets 3 uh, palmary and dorsally 6 you also have to know the exact order of these tendon uh, sheets. I just want to draw your attention to the, um, some uh, tendon sheath problems. For example, <clears throat> uh, you all heard about ganglia, which have nothing to do with nerve ganglia, although some people believe that these are uh, nerve uh, uh, structures. They are simply, as shown in this picture, uh, cysts, elevations, outbursts from the synovial membrane and these are typically uh, appear where we have the, a lot of synovial membranes for example in the wrist area many times we have these like little ball things here many times they have to be removed uh, surgically although they don't hurt or this is what we also ask sometimes in the exam the palmar tendon sheets here in these pictures you can see that uh, they run <coughs> to the end uh, fingertips on the thumb and on the little finger. The other three fingers they stop and then they start again. This makes it possible, this uh, uh, clears why it's more dangerous to have an infection on the thumb or little finger, more dangerous than in the other three fingers because the infection can spread to the carpal region and then can even spread backwards and this is called the V phlegmona because it has a sh V shape and of course then you can spread or uh, the infection can also spread more proximally and can be very dangerous. And then finally uh, I'm sure you all heard about uh, uh, tenovaginitis uh, rep repetitive force for use of the hands, excessive friction of the tendons can cause inflammation with a lot of writing or piano playing. Uh, this is a very typical uh, problem. So then we will continue with the nerves next time. Thank you.